Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpe, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. And welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm Brian Kruger, the producer of the show. Today we have an interesting interview that was recorded just over a year ago. Richard invited his friend, Dr. Richard Enos, a professor emeritus of rhetoric and composition at Texas Christian University, and also an associate dean for academic affairs at Carnegie Mellon, among other impressive positions, to talk about the societal collapse in antiquity, and more specifically in ancient Greece and Athens. Now, I'm putting this all into context because on the day this was recorded last year, Vladimir Putin had just invaded the Ukraine. Now, we think listening to this conversation in retrospect is pretty interesting. So, Rich starts this conversation with those events unfolding at that time. So, we join Rich and Dr. Enos in conversation. Welcome to the Common Bridge. I'm sure as we go through this very difficult period in history, we have to wonder, has this ever happened before? Today, our guest, Dr. Richard Leo Enos, is going to explain some things to us uh, from the ancient world. Dr. Enos, are there parallels between what's happening in the world today and at other times in history? Well, Rich, first, thank you for having me on. And I want to say an emphatic yes. In fact, as I watched the news unfold today, it, I was struck by the issues that we're facing and the similarities of the things that I study. And Hopefully, in our discussion today, the lessons we can learn from those past studies. Well, let's get into that and some of your past studies. Now, uh, our audience likes to know a little bit about uh, our guests on the show. So tell us, where did you grow up and what were your early days like? And you've got a very deep academic background. Uh, your entire bio is on our website, richardhelpy.com. Uh, and at the Common Bridge on Substack. So please, uh, listeners, viewers, readers, join us there. But tell us a little bit. Uh, you were grew up in the Bay Area of California, I believe. Yes, I did, Rich. I grew up in Oakland, California. And inside Oakland, there is an Italian district called the Temescal District. My parents I mean, excuse me, my grandparents came from Italy at the turn of the 20th century and the Northern Italians settled in that area. And I grew up my, with my parents and grandmother in her house. Uh, we were a working family. My father was a welder. In fact, I was the first one ever to go to college in our family. Mm. Uh, and I went, I was brought up in a very strict Roman Catholic religion, but uh, at the same time, I also learned from, especially my mother, my father passed when he was very young, uh, an appreciation for all different religions and an understanding of different ways to use religion to help us. And uh, I was able to go to college at what was then called Cal State Hayward, now it's Cal State University, East Bay. And then I went to graduate school at Indiana University in Bloomington. I taught at the University of Michigan. Then I went to uh, Carnegie Mellon Un University for several years. I was offered an endowed chair at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, and I accepted that. And I formally retired from 46 years of teaching in uh, 2019 but I still like to keep active in my research. And uh, through this miracle of Zoom, I'm able to give lectures at different universities from time to time. And, and what's been your area of specialty through your academic preparation and your study? Well, I started off with, a, and maybe this is because of my family background, uh, 
Uh, I started off with a general interest in communication. I know this will sound odd, and this phenomenon may never happen again, but when my mother, who was born in America, went to school, she couldn't speak English. She could only speak Italian. And I became very interested in communication, but then I became very interested in the history of language, in the area of rhetoric and how people are influenced. And so as I went on through school, I had graduate minors in history and classics, and I studied the relationship between how people think and how they express those thoughts through history. And uh, those ideas transfer, I think, very well. So for many years, both at Carnegie Mellon especially and TCU, I taught courses in propaganda analysis because many of the theories have their origin back in antiquity, although there's been a tremendous body of current research, of course. But I try to bring those two things together for my students when I teach propaganda analysis and try to help them do obviously what's in the title of the course to analyze discourse, but also ultimately to help them make what they feel are good judgments about the discourse that they hear. That, that is so appropriate to our times and um, the amount of language and communication that's flying around on uh, all of these different platforms. Um, and so today I hope that we can cover in, you know, 40 minutes or so that, you know, empires that rise, empires fall, um, history repeating itself. And I know you'll be educating the readers of the Common Bridge with a column that you've written for our first newsletter that comes out on March 7th. Um, on this show, we've made parallels with the United States Civil War uh, as we seem to be pushed into this red and blue camp or we're being dragged there. Um, and we need to look at the parallels with the United States and failed empires. And I know there's some uh, markers that you look for, like the uh, devaluation of currency. So, you know, to the extent that we can try to fit a graduate level course or from introduction to grad level uh, about the Greek and the Roman and the British empires and especially their their uh, rise and fall, um, let's let's dive into to talking about some of the greatest empires of all time. Um, so how do we define the greatest empires well, of often, all time? I was thinking a great deal about this, and um, I think often and maybe always behind every great empire, there is a powerful figure. And sometimes they are called mm -hmm. dynasts. They are these larger than life personalities and their impact does a great deal toward facilitating and extending in some cases empires. Now this could be used, this could be abused. We all, we all know that uh, individuals such as Adolf Hitler was a very powerful individual. And in fact, even formally in Germany, as I tell my students, the power that he received to become the Fuhrer, which meant he was both in charge as the equivalent of a prime minister and in charge of all the military, was freely given by the Germans. He didn't take it. He didn't, it wasn't forced upon but that illustrates the the dynamics of his capacity. But of course, that capacity can be abused. And one of the things we need to ask very fundamental questions about is, can we actually teach responsible leadership? Can we teach people to become leaders? And there was a great deal of interest in this, of course, after World War II, and uh, and since then, but really, it's an historical question. Some people are surprised to learn that universities such as Oxford and Cambridge were founded not to provide their students with jobs. Their the universities were founded to create the leaders of the British Empire. These would be the people who would guide the empire. And there was an effort to try to do that. And we know great leaders can have great impact. Um, we know, for example, that, you know, the examples are obvious. Winston Churchill 
could unite a people against tyranny. Martin Luther King Jr. could try to uh, have a peaceful, nonviolent resolution to very strong social issues. And of course, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. King Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. was for his efforts. But my point is, is that we can look at powerful individuals and see how they can influence people, even to the ex extent of empires. So when we look at empires, and um, you know, I think about the Greek uh, Empire and the Roman Empire, um, and in preparing for this uh, talk today, um, looking up the greatest empires of all time, I was surprised they weren't in the top 20, mm -hmm. um, that there was more about the uh, Mongol and the Russian Empire, the Persian Empire, mm -hmm. um, and the concept of empires like, you know, Greece and India hadn't happened yet. When you think as a, a someone with your uh, deep background, the greatest empires of all time, what do they have in common about the commonality of their rise and and maybe what about the elements of decline and any examples that you can share with us would be great as well. Right. I think one of the things that will obviously beg the question I get in class is, well, what do we mean by great? Is it just an emotive term? We're saying we strongly approve of it. We strongly like it. Can it be unpacked? Can it be defined in some ways? And of course, mm -hmm. if we look at large empires that were militarily oriented and coercive and judged their greatness by the amount of land they were able to conquer, the number of people they were able to control. We can look at it that way. Uh, what we have to do is to take a step back and to say, are there any other measurements, any other determinants of greatness? Now, to take one of the examples, Rich, that you mentioned, uh, when I studied in Greece, I had the opportunity to actually go to the site of Marathon, where principally there were a few other city-states that helped, but principally it was the citizens of the city of Athens versus the Persian Empire's ar uh, army. And there is absolutely no way that you would think that the Athenians could have won but Herodotus, the great historian, teaches us a valuable lesson. He said the reason why the Athenians won is that they had a collective sense, a communal sense of what the best way to fight the Persians was. And their collective genius enabled this small, insignificant, in the eyes of the Persians, city-state, kind of a backwater city in the views of the Persians to actually conquer the Persians. And there's a great lesson that Herodotus says is, and he argues the value of democracy, the collective wisdom is better than the tyranny of a single person. And doing just the will of the king or the emperor or the Fuhrer is not as good as having an environment where the best ideas take precedent, not just who says the idea. You know, that's fascinating um, because, and I've, I've spent just a few days in Russia, and of course I got out and talked to as many people as I could, being, uh, that's just what I do where, when I go. Uh, and it was a time when uh, Russia was a little bit uh, rudderless, and they, I drew the impression that they liked having a strong leader. So, it, and of course, we're recording this on the morning that uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine. And with a uh, person at the helm of Russia, Vladimir Putin, who's been there since 1999, uh, including reworking their constitutional processes uh, in order to remain in power that long. Uh, if I heard you correctly, and that empires sometimes have a very strong personality leading, but that ultimately becomes their Achilles heel. Does the Russian empire embody that or do they stand out as something different? 
Well, one of the things that impresses me about uh, the dynamics of what's going on today is to look at the various leaderships and how they're structured. Uh, I'll say up front that I, I need to know much more about Putin and the entire delicate workings that go on today. But I do believe that Putin has been in power for about 20 years. And uh, I think that one of the advantages that America has is that we have a process where the transfer of power is is a procedure. It's a great upon. supposed to be. It's supposed to be. And I realize that yeah. it's being challenged, but uh, regardless of what view you have, but we have a system in place to transfer power and to resolve problems through our court system. And I don't know the particulars of the Russian system. I'll be the first one to say that, but it seems to be quite different than what we have. And when you have such a strong person who remains in power for so long, then I think it brings a kind of, maybe they think stability, but also uh, a set of problems about changing and adapting to meet the responses of the times and the wills of the, of the people. And um, I think that that is a primary concern. We just really have two different paradigms. And I think uh, the difficulty with, that we see with Russia is this, the, the continual presence of Putin has uh, really not shown how we can resolve problems by looking at different people who have provided different perspectives from within Russia. We he seem to hear his voice and his voice alone. And then with America, there's a cacophony of voices, which can be frustrating, but it's part of a democracy. It goes back to what we said about the Athenians, rival views, making strong arguments, trying to find the best course of action. We know from history. Yeah, and, and, yes. And I was just going to comment that this is why I think we have so much uh, agitation and heightened concern around the uh, issues re relative to the electoral vote counts uh, last January. Mm -hmm. And similarly, um, you know, so many billions of people using a product of uh, Facebook by name, whose business model is to take your private information and, and then censor what you can say. It's not the public square. Um, and, and of course, they're not the only ones, but um, that can those voices be heard? And, you know, Soviet era Russia was very adept at blocking any transmission of information. Um, but, I, you know, I was curious, and when I think about the commonalities of empires that rise, one of them is moral leadership. And did Russia ever enjoy Russia, uh, moral leadership? in their time or economic advancement or, you know, or science and technology. They've been pretty good about that over the years or just a, the strongest military to impose their will. How did they become strong in, in, in uh, ancient times and how are they viewed today in terms of uh, those elements of a strong empire? Aristotle once said that educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And part of what should be inherent in the development of leadership are how uh, to develop strong ethical standards. There is a reason why the patron of all educators, who was the Roman rhetorician named Quintilian, was the teacher of the imperial families of Rome, because they saw that inherent in leadership was a moral obligation. And sometimes uh, my students will say, well, isn't every value just your own? And why is yours any better or worse than anyone else's? And that's mm -hmm. where sure. we can adjudicate and argue questions of value and preference, right? In other words, 
I, I give them uh, what sounds like a ridiculous example. Suppose I said, well, suppose Hitler said, well, this is just how I feel and this is just my point of view and this is how I feel about different races and that. But behind him stands at its time the most sophisticated army in the world. And he can, mm-hmm. through coercion, impose that will. That's not a good system. A system that says, make your strongest argument, we'll give you a fair hearing. It will be adjudicated by normal, rational people who can contest it, question it, doubt it, debate it, and then hopefully through nonviolent ways come to a resolution for a course of action. And we've had in the 20th century, and we don't have to get into this, there was a very serious study on how to evaluate ethical arguments. How can we do this? Can we make a serious study of it? And there was tremendous work done in trying to do that. So part of the education of leaderships is the moral responsibility of learning how to make ethical propositions. At some universities, and I probably shouldn't mention these names, I was called into the president's office and essentially some entities, I'll be as vague as possible, have a lot of money. And they would say, if you do X, Y, and Z of this kind of research, here's the amount of money we'll give you. And uh, one of the questions we have to ask is not just accepting the money, no matter how much they wave at you, but ought we to do this? Is this in harmony with the mission, the values, the vision of the university? I give them an example, and I hope this isn't off the point, but it's a really powerful example for me when I was young. Uh, Wilhelm Rentgen, who was a German who essentially, I'll make it short, developed the X-ray. An American company, and I believe it was at the time, this is at the turn of the 20th century, well, a little bit after the turn of the 20th century. An American company, I believe it was General Electric, offered Rentgen Um, at the time, a million dollars if they could have exclusive patent rights. So, which means they would be the only ones to develop the X-ray or what it was called in Germany, the Rentgen race, still called that. Uh, And Rentgen made a statement. He said that the object of our research is the betterment of humanity. So Rentgen declared an open patent and gave all of the plans of doing X-rays free to everyone. Now, I believe for that, and I hope I'm right, he received the first Nobel Prize. And I think it's a Nobel Prize, obviously, in science, but I think it should also be a Nobel Prize in morality. Yeah, he he developed something for the betterment of mankind, and instead of hoarding it for a profit or power, uh, made sure it was available to many people. And I think that was some of your opening comments about needing to have moral uh, leadership in in order to justify the power that goes with some of these empires. Uh, Now you've studied empires that decline, that they, they rise, they, they prosper, they flourish, and then they begin to decline. Are there common elements that mark the end of an era for a particular empire? Well, I think um, clearly in the ones that you and I have been talking about, when you have a a very powerful personality and that person just uh, ages, the very qualities that brought them to contribute to whatever they did uh, wane. And if you don't have Mm -hmm. a structure in place, then the foundation is going to be at risk because it's so based upon an individual. Suppose, for example, you had a department that was just not careful in planning, but just had tremendous individual scholars. Well, after those scholars retire, you don't have anything left. Now think of an empire. If you don't have a structure in place to bring out the best in the next generation, then it's more likely and inevitable that it's going to be less than it was unless you're fortunate enough just to have another person. 
In other words, sometimes the daughter or the son or someone else will inherit the traits and pass them on, but that's a very poor plan for success and endurance. And, and I recall at the uh, end of the uh, Soviet Union, um, there was one you know very elderly person after another, um, Chernyenko and Dropoff, um, uh, and I know there were two, at least two more. Uh, they would uh, get into power and they'd be dead within months. But the, but there was no system backing them up. It was just a a succession of individuals. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, they seemed rather directionless. And perhaps uh, Putin is tapping into that uh, that desire, spoken or unspoken, on behalf of the Russian people for a strong leader uh, that will make Russia a strong country. Um, but I, I just wonder how much you know popular support he really has um you know or is their moral compass just pointing in a different direction well i wish i knew more about russia i'm I'm openly you know making it clear that i'm not an expert in russian politics or russian culture but it seems to me that uh this country has enormous resources and enormous potential and could do wonderful things it just needs to have the structure in place to make sure that those goals can be continued. And, and if that happens, then they have to have an environment where they can challenge leadership openly and mm-hmm. freely. And right now, as just an outsider, that seems to be not the case. I don't know what the collective will of the Russian people is. I'm not and uh, well, let, let's let's come, let's come back to something a little closer to home then um you've taught hundreds and hundreds of students if not thousands you've been with some of the top academics in the world uh you've done research on behalf of some of the most prestigious universities and, and other ngos around the world uh, and certainly you think about parallels and differences if you were going to step back and look at the United States, where we've been the dominant country in the world for some time, what do you do? You ever think about where the United States is today relative to some of the other civilizations that you've studied, and and you know pros cons, lessons to be learned, inevitabilities. Where where do we sit when when someone with your background thinks about that? Well, one of the things that I've been very fortunate in, very incredibly lucky, is is that I have been able to be near truly great minds. Uh, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, uh, a person who lived on my same street and had his office one floor above me won the Nobel Prize, Herb Simon. And uh, mm-hmm. when I was at Michigan, uh, I was in the same department briefly with Arthur Miller, who wrote Death of a Salesman. And you get, there's a wonderful thing about not only exposing the students, but the faculty to these, to these talented, obviously talented and very, you know, uh, uh, amazingly gifted people is that you can learn from them. You can learn about what to do. And what struck me as being this kind of spectator is Part of their greatness and part of their academic leadership is they asked and didn't hesitate to ask questions that seemed so basic. Like, for example, let me give you, can you actually teach people to be smarter? Not just give them facts. Like if I said, okay, uh, I'll make one up. The height of the Eiffel Tower is about 990 feet. Okay. Okay. Now you know that. Does that make you any smarter? Well, you know a fact, but what do you do with it and how do you connect facts and how do you problem solve? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we were involved in this, especially at Carnegie Mellon, because we were trying to help create machines that think and 
to res- and to enable them to take massive amounts of these sort of Eiffel Tower facts and put them together in ways to saw connections, problems, observations that were would be very difficult for any one person to do. And it was an exciting time for me. There's a wonderful book called The Mind's Best Work by Perkins, which is an old book, but it talks about this dynamic period. I'm really happy that I was able to see these things. But the implications are far beyond just artificial intelligence, because it shows that in education today, we can teach students to be smarter. I guess if I wanted to do a, a, a metaphor, you're, you're not just wired when you're born. You can be rewired or the wiring can be uh, super conducted and you have all sorts of potential. We've all heard that before about how we just tap in barely to what we can do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is that if we put these things to use, we can do tremendous good. We can really, I have been as a outsider, I, I just amazed at this minor miracle of how, and maybe it's not minor, of how we developed a vaccine for COVID so quickly. It was incredible yeah. when the world pulled together and said, look, this is a world problem. We're going to get our best minds. We're pouring resources in to do everything we can to save lives. And uh, they used to give that, I think it was a uh, Star Trek uh, phrase of at warp speed, I think is what they used to say. And it was incredible what we could do when our education was directed toward goals that were shared in common. And I'm uh, excited about education that can do that for the betterment of not of everyone, not just a few. And, and I like that as an example, because um, uh, when we look at the commonality of a empire rising, you know, it's a scientific or technology breakthrough. Okay. The space race of the sixties with the, uh, Russian Empire and the American Empire, um, uh, you know, fueled by a great education system. And then when we look at the elements of decline, something you and I have talked about in the past, it, it's the complacency of the populace. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the Romans going to the Colosseum to be entertained versus putting in the hard work to learn. And today we have a lot of people doing video games and uh, we don't really want to do standardized tests because they're very difficult. And, you know, maybe math is something we need to back away from because everybody's not good at it. <laughs> Those to me seem like, yeah, well, you know, it's like, OK, we're not going to teach math anymore. The very thing that lets us develop vaccines and lets us, uh, you know, do space travel. Right. It, it's it, you can kind of see where the, the rise and the fall uh, of, of these. And then another item you and I have talked about is the the role of the military and how the most powerful armies in the world could impose their will. And then what happens at, at the end of an empire where the militaries are spread around the world and they just can't be supported. Did, didn't the Romans experience that? And today the United States with uh, military operations in like, I want to say 95 countries, something in that order. Is that, is that Germany? Well, when the when the British historian Gibbons wrote the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, he explained it as a stupendous fabric whose own weight crushed itself. That they kept extending, they kept develop, and so essentially, as my Roman history professor tried to impress upon me, is that they that Rome had a city management model for an empire. An empire is not a city; it's not just a big city. It has all kinds of unique things. And the vision to change that, to really recognize the differences that are always going, you know, we, uh, it's called the queen of hearts effect. Um, it goes like this, the, uh, I think paleontologists use this analogy. They'll say the herbivores don't want to get eaten by the carnivores. So they have to learn how to run faster and get away. But the carnivores have to eat, so they get have to get faster and trickier. And so 
you're always running in this as fast as you can to stay in the same place. And what's happening is that some of the empires decayed because they didn't run fast enough. They stayed with the old model. You know, one of the mm. dangerous things people could say is, well, we've always done it this way. That would be good if things always stayed the same way. But they don't. They're constantly the queen of hearts, changing in dynamics, and we have to be able to do this. But to get back to your other point, which I thought was a very telling one, uh, I think one of, and this is my opinion, is that one of the problems that we just was inevitable is that we had to have distance learning in school. We had to have everything done for the safety, and that's all understandable. But Plato argued that the best education is direct oral communication. And I think one of the things that happened with at-home education is not only did, pe- did, t- did parents learn how hard it is to teach when they had to do it for themselves, but that uh, apathy can come in, that, uh, that students can literally distance away, that they can turn off their screen oh, and do all yeah. sorts of other things and pretend that they're listening. And I think it's the engagement and passion and interest. We There was a body of research done by a brilliant scholar named John R. Hayes who asked a very simple question. What do geniuses have in common? And uh, there was a, a tremendous body of, of powerful work that came out. And essentially, the one th- and they were different in all different areas, math, music, chess, humanities. They're all different in every way, but one. They were all, but the one has some way to unpack. They were all incredibly hard workers, but they also, they were hard workers, which meant they were tolerating failure. They were able to pick up if they didn't Mm -hmm. succeed, they would pick up and try again. And I tell my students, you know, sometimes some sciences brag about their failures. They'll say, you know, I did this experiment 130 times before I got things right. They brag about it. And that's the mark of of a contributor. But I'm not sure if the phenomenon that we went through in the last two and a half years really helped to teach that component. And of course- Well, where I I think it showed that we didn't learn, and I've talked about it on my program, is that we've put uh, leadership Uh, into a position of saying, I don't know, or you know what, I went down a wrong path. Uh, You know, know, today you look at the shifting COVID policies. And instead of saying, you know, look, we made a decision based on the information we had at the time and conditions changed. So now we're saying this, it's more akin to, no, I never said that. What it's like, well, you did, we record, it's been recorded. So we haven't given our, our leadership an opportunity to say that they tried some things, found it wasn't the right path, and made an adjustment. So, Professor Eno, as we kind of move to the latter stages of our talk today, when you think about the United States of America, what does our future look like? And, you know, if, if you could advise, you know, the President of the United States or the you know, leadership of the Fed or, you know, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, what counsel would you give them about, hey, these are things the country needs to do. These are things the country needs to avoid, you know, based on a study of history. What what should we be doing as a country right now? And what should we be running away from? Well, I think there's um, two phases that we should address. One is a short term. What can we do right now? And one of the things Mm -hmm. that we have to do is to embrace and be tolerant of opposition and to not feel that you can't make a mistake, especially when it's done in the best interest and, and, and yet go on because it's usually success. It comes through tolerance for failure and keep trying, not quitting, not quitting. And, and I think we have to convey that. I once saw, I knew this wonderful woman who was, the survivor of a labor camp from Nazi uh, in Poland that was run by the Nazis. And she used to, her name was Sophia Pollack, very modest, escaped, came to America. And she used to tell me, Richard, the only perfect people are in insane asylums. 
we have to be tolerant. We have to embrace rival views. We have to be able to work together. Uh, and the long-term solution, and I'm, I'm really showing my bias, is education. But it's not just education, educa- it's education on how to become not only learning facts, but teaching people how to un- recognize that there is an ethical component to every decision. There is an ought, O-U-G-H-T, to almost everything we do. Ought we to do this? And to really understand that education should help people to learn how to make good judgments, which is what Aristotle talked about. He said the Greek word crisis, which is just like the word we have, means judgment. We make a judgment and we try to have good reasons to support it. So if we couple our scientific education with humanistic studies of values, preferences, arguments, deliberation, I think we'll realize our educational dream for the long-term solutions that we value and are uh, going to be a tremendous benefit for what I think is to make an already great country a great, a, an even greater one. Well, I think that is such profound wisdom and sage advice um, that hopefully we can pivot from what appears to me and others that we're on the precipice of a civil war. Um, we need to get to civil discussion. Uh, this notion that we have of a country filled of red people and blue people is ridiculous. Um, we should be talking and trying to solve problems. Uh, this has been a really grand conversation and one that we could dive into for several hours. But as we wrap up on today's Common Bridge, are there any closing thoughts you'd like to leave our audience with? Well, I want to say the, the obvious that I'm honored and flattered to be asked. I took it very seriously. Oh, I tried to say things that I ho- hope would be helpful for people to think about. Uh, I I believe that the country has done so much and has such a wonderful history that we need to fight the temptation or allow people to think that we're going to give up on this American dream. I think earlier generations have been challenged. Certainly our grandparents were challenged by World War II and look how they responded. They literally mm-hmm. laid down their lives to, to continue. And we should not hesitate to remember how valuable that was and not to sacrifice that just because we have disagreement. There are alternatives to coercion or ambivalence. And the alternative is fruitful social deliberation. And I believe that as quaint as that may sound to some cynical listeners, I truly believe that's what I tried to get across today is the best course of action. And eloquently stated, and I'd like to let my readers and viewers know that you'll be able to read uh, a, a entry from Dr. Richard Leo Enos on the Common Bridge newsletter, first edition published on March the 7th, 2022. Um, also look him up. He's uh, widely published uh, in very prestigious uh, journals and publications, uh, a distinguished academic career from Cal State Hayward, Indiana University, the University of Michigan, Carnegie Mellon University, Texas Christian University, and of course, from other academic settings, universities throughout the world uh, for his uh, renowned prowess uh, in his subject matter of rhetoric, ancient histories, English communications, and a long list of others. Uh, But you can find his publications, his speaking engagements uh, on the World Wide Web. For The Common Bridge, this is Rich Helpy inviting you to join us at Substack.com, at Mission Control Radio, uh, on your favorite podcast outlet on YouTube TV. Uh, Please join us in this nonpartisan discussion as we try to look at the world through eyes of people that want to make a contribution and have a a respectful dialogue with each other. And with our special guest, Dr. Richard Leo Enos, this is Rich Helpy signing off 
on the Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on the Common Bridge. Subscribe to the Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for the Common Bridge. You can also find the Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.